I think with anyone, I often, if it's appropriate, recommend medication, right? So there are some things that can help with sleep um, in discussing with a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner or a pediatrician who can prescribe possibly something that, again, it's not going to like, you know, cure the OCD or stop the thoughts from coming. But a lot of times uh, medication will help just like quiet down the intensity or kind of somewhat like the volume of the thoughts. Um, so that can be something else that we'd recommend um, speaking with a provider to see if anything can help in terms of sleep. Welcome to OCD Whisperer Podcast. Today with me, I have a special guest, Alnardo Martinez. He is a licensed mental health counselor in the Anxiety Disorders Center and for school and community programs at the Child Mind Institute. Mr. Martinez specializes in the evaluation and treatment of anxiety-related disorders in children, teens, and young adults. He has extensive experience treating obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety, selective mutism, generalist anxiety disorder, and specific phobias. He also has prior experience working with learning and Development Center to provide bilingual Spanish neuropsychological evaluations. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Christina. Absolutely. So we actually just checked in a moment ago because, you know, I know you have expertise in a lot of areas. And one of the things I know that I've seen time and time again is people ask a lot about OCD and sleep. Um, people really struggle sleeping when they're having racing thoughts, when they're having intrusions, when anxiety, you know, seems like it's, you know, really high, like a 10 out of 10. And they find they can't, they can't quite sleep. They can't quiet their mind. I hear th comments like sleep hygiene. I heard of something like that or trying to meditate, but I can't. And then of course, because I can't sleep, I can't function the next day. It becomes this chronic cycle. So that's kind of big topic, but I thought let's dive into it and see if we can unpack it a little bit. If you can share a little bit with us about what are some common issues people face, if we can start with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're right. I think a lot of the clients I work with will often say that sleep is a big factor. It's usually interrupted. They get poor sleep or the quality of sleep isn't good. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one, like you mentioned already, is like intrusive thoughts or racing starts or racing thoughts before bed are very difficult to try to like manage or um, quiet down. Right. We're trying to sleep. So we're trying to shut off our brain. There's not really a lot of distractions. There's not noises. We're not focused on anything else. Um, so that really gives an opportunity for a lot of like those intrusive thoughts to really kind of come in and kind of pummel the brain in that moment of falling asleep. I think another kind of issue or another situation that comes up pretty frequently is like compulsions rituals around bedtime, right? So sometimes someone may be completing uh, rituals for like an hour, two hours before bedtime. Um, and then that keeps them up a lot later than they were maybe initially planning to. So then they'll get like a shorter amount of sleep, which we know like having good sleep, um, having enough sleep is going to be really important for their ability to face that next day. Got it. So I guess the thing that you know, most people would want to know is what can you do about it? And I think I'd like to ask this in two parts. One is what can the person with OCD do about it? And the second part is if you're a loved one, if you're a parent, significant other, a sibling, what can you do to help that person? Yeah. So I think if you're the person with OCD, who's kind of struggling with like these kind of symptoms coming up around bedtime, I know often we hear kind of like the phrase sleep hygiene and like, what does that even mean? Or how do we even do that? So I think that's a good thing to talk about first. And then we can talk about like other things that can help. So when we discuss sleep hygiene, I think what we're talking about is like having kind of a gentle, flexible routine, right? Because we don't want to be too rigid about what we're doing. And we don't want this to become its own kind of ritual or compulsion, but we're thinking about a routine that helps us kind of wind down from maybe like a long or busy, stressful day, right? So sometimes we'll recommend maybe like 30 to 45 minutes before bedtime, trying as hard as we can to unplug from screens, right? Because we know that those things kind of keep us up, keep our brain running. And so part of a sleep hygiene routine could be like reading before bedtime or something else that's maybe less stimulating and a little more quiet. Another important part of sleep hygiene is trying to, if possible, because this may not be possible for everybody, but trying to only use our bed for sleep. 
right? So when we're associating our bed with like staying up, scrolling on YouTube for hours, or we associate our bed with like just being in there throughout the day, it's kind of hard for us to realize or remember to shut down uh, when it comes time when we're actually trying to fall asleep. I think a couple other things that help with sleep hygiene is trying to create like a consistent routine of when we're going to sleep and when we're waking up. So if we're always kind of fluctuating between like a late bedtime and an early wake or early wake and and late um, or early bedtime, uh, it can be difficult because our brains tend to run kind of on a schedule or on a cycle. Um, So if we're waking up and going to sleep around the same time, that's another really helpful part of sleep hygiene. And so what can somebody do then? So there's that piece. What about for the intrusive Kind of stuff that's happening. What can somebody do to address that along with, with the sleep hygiene process? Yeah. So in terms of addressing like the intrusive thoughts or some compulsions that come up around bedtime, I think it depends on the person and what they're doing with their clinician. Um, and if they have like a treatment plan or if they're working on exposures. I think for people who maybe necessarily aren't in full treatment or really ready to tackle some of their compulsions or some of those and do like exposures or uh, whatever treatment they're using, if it's like ICBT or ACT or or any of the other kinds that are out there. For me, I might recommend doing something that will help with um, kind of quieting or even momentarily distracting from some of those thoughts. Well, of course, we're not saying distraction is the treatment or the way um, to really kind of overcome OCD or the thoughts, but that can be really helpful. So a lot of um, clients, I might recommend that they listen to like a guided, um, maybe like sleep meditation, um, either like an app or on YouTube um, and kind of work on focusing on that. And that can often sometimes, um, often or sometimes help them fall asleep. And Aisha, I was going to ask about meditation. Well, let's say somebody's doing that. Is there anything else they could do if the, those things are not working um, to try to problem solve or what might be another resource? Yeah, I mean, I think another resource if sleep is uh, like a disruption, and, you know, I think with anyone, I often, if it's appropriate, recommend medication, right? So there are some things that can help with sleep um, in discussing with a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner or a pediatrician who can prescribe possibly something that, again, it's not going to like, you know, cure the OCD or stop the thoughts from coming. But a lot of times uh, medication will help just like quiet down the intensity or kind of somewhat like the volume of the thoughts. Um, so that could be something else that we'd recommend um, speaking with a provider to see if anything can help in terms of sleep. Right. And then the second part of that, of course, was what can loved ones do, right? So whether you're, and maybe it's different for if you're a parent versus a significant other or a sibling. So if we can go through that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I think if you're someone who has a loved one, Um, who has OCD and it's really a struggle for them to go to sleep. I think first you want to try to validate those feelings, right? You want to try to not be dismissive. You don't really want to say, oh, it's not a big deal. Just go to sleep, close your eyes and fall asleep. Like that's not going to be something that's helpful. Um, You know, I generally, generally will recommend them just starting with some kind of like validating phrase, like I can see how sleep is difficult for you um, and I want to be as supportive as I can. Um, And so then, you know, that's where it becomes uh, maybe sometimes tricky in terms of not getting involved or too accommodating or engaging in compulsions, right? Someone will say, well, if you really want to help me, you'll just help me do this compulsion and then I'll be able to fall asleep. And so we don't want them to kind of get involved in those ways. We can work on trying to create an environment that maybe does facilitate some sleep or relaxation, right? So depending on what we're doing, if it's possible, things that aren't too loud or disruptive, um, if we know that person is trying to fall asleep and and then um, helping them create. So if it's like a child, helping them create a room that's kind of like comfortable as well. Um, So kind of what others can do in terms of going back to that sleep hygiene is if possible, sometimes when a room is like cooler or comfortable or darker shades, um, those can be things that loved ones might provide or help with to kind of make the environment kind of more suitable for sleeping. Those are great. And, you know, I'm also thinking through, um, and I wonder, are there any cultural considerations that should be taken into account? And I'm thinking through just in general, you know, cultures do have different ways they might perceive one any kind of disorder and, you know, to how they might communicate or support or not. I'm just wondering if we can kind of go through what, what might some of those things be? 
Yeah. So in terms of like OCD and sleep and then taking some like cultural consideration to account, you know, I think it in some cultures and I know like coming from like a Hispanic culture myself, I think there's sometimes a struggle to one, like acknowledge a disorder. Right. So if you are a loved one, if you have OCD, but your loved one maybe has trouble like acknowledging that it's a thing um, or in some cultures, I know it's like the idea of validating um, or really accommodating, even in a way that's not like enabling, but just like a general accommodation can be a struggle. Um, so I think in those, if you're a person with OCD who has a family member who's not, you know, maybe culturally as open to validating or, or mental health, generally tend to then shift the focus and the conversation about more so symptoms, right? Or the function of behaviors or the function of symptoms. I think that tends to get a little bit more buy-in in some of these areas than necessarily saying, this is OCD and this is why I'm doing this. It's more of like, okay, um, we both really want me to have good sleep. So say if it's a teenager, we both really want me to have good sleep so that I can go to school the next day and do well. So these are things that would be helpful or this is the way that you could support um, or this is what I need rather than saying like I'm up doing this compulsion and I'm like cleaning or rearranging things over and over again them just saying we'll just stop doing that but if we frame it the other way they might be more willing or open to helping I think that's a really great example that you're using um I love that that shifting that away from or changing the way we talk about it because yeah for some some people hearing this quote-unquote diagnosis or term might seem foreign or just not something we culturally generally accept or think around or stigma or whatnot. So um, yeah, I think that that's a really great reframe. Actually get to that place where we can educate them and help them understand and see. Um, but I've noticed we generally get there better if we start with like these functional kind of symptom things rather than saying like a disorder, because I think in a lot of cultures, disorders, you know, that word even itself is so like stigmatized and seems like a life ending, you know, kind of phrase that if we say that, then they're kind of shut off to it. I don't want my kid to like not be successful or I don't want my partner to not have a good life. You're saying they have a disorder, then it's almost like that phrase makes them feel out of control, which I think, you know tends so it tends to be easier if we go like symptom based. Yeah, yeah. As we're talking about this, there's there's one kind of subtype, if you will, that comes to mind that I think is not talked about enough. And I certainly know I think we can all agree, anybody listening, and any whatever your subtype is, is the one, of course, that that's the most troubling because that's the one you're dealing with. But there's one that I know doesn't doesn't get discussed, which is false memory OCD. You know, and and if you're dealing with something like that, can we dive a little bit into that? Like, like what is that exactly? How can that manifest? You know, how that might disturb your sleep or ability to get any meaningful rest? You know. And, you know, you may mention that some of the similar processes you might want to use for that, or maybe there's other other things a person might want to consider to help them, you know, think, think through this maybe holistically or otherwise. Yeah, no, I think that's a great kind of place to go to. Um, so I think when we're we're kind of talking about false memory OCD, it can be a little tricky. Um, it often kind of similarly will involve like distressing thoughts or intrusive thoughts or the fear, you know, could be that maybe you accidentally or don't remember like committing a serious crime or some like an immoral action um, or really kind of just anything that might go against a person's kind of innate values or what's important to them. Um, and again, it's important to realize that there really is no evidence or maybe any actual occurrence of that event ever happening. And so, you know, what that might look like is, you know, someone could have a false memory, intrusive thought that they stole, you know, something from a store. Um, so they leave the store. Oh, did I steal something? Did I, did I, you know, rob the store? Um, even if they don't have any items on them, right? They were only in the store for a moment. They checked out, purchased the items that they were going for. And so, you know, kind of that situation will play over and over in their head. Um, and then what tends to happen, and more so like compulsion wise, could be like replaying situations over and over in their mind, trying to like imagine, okay, I'm walking through the store. This is what I did. This is where I went next. This is what I grabbed. Trying to convince themselves like no I remember checking out I remember buying these things um so it could involve like a lot of mental rituals or compulsions to walk through situations and then even checking right so someone might test like all right if I go back to the store and see if like a security guard stops me because they know I stole something um so there could be like multiple forms of checking 
um, that are involved when it comes with like false memory OCD. And so if they're stuck in that process, and, and I think, you know, one thing I want to mention too, is that with false memory, you know, like you said, right, it could be any of those examples. And I think some of the examples too, that, you know, just because you don't hear an exact example given right now, doesn't mean that it's not valid or what you're dealing with. I just want people to remember that. Cause I think sometimes people can misinterpret things and think, well, he didn't mention mine. And it's like, yeah. you know, like, yeah. like, okay, folks, so like, remember, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. We're not going to go through ever comb through every exact example, but we have to remember what OCD is, the disorder and how it works. And false memory could be about what you just mentioned. Maybe I stole something. It might be, maybe you're not sure if something, you did something inappropriate sexually or otherwise, or maybe somebody did, did something to you and we can get kind of convoluted and confused. But to your point is that there really is no evidence. And even if you do ask or look, you get evidence frequently contrary to it, um, or at least neutral, but then you might not perceive it as neutral. You're going to want to read into it and say, no, but I think it still might be this thing, or it might mean that and so on. Um, And so would you say that for even something like that, how would somebody go about with this particular, let's say, theme, what could they do to help them get some meaningful rest? Yeah, so this is a good one. Yeah, because definitely it's going to involve a lot of like mental compulsions, like I mentioned, like replaying situations, overthinking, trying to maybe even like replay conversations. And sometimes these things can go back as like, as far as childhood, right? This person could be like an, an adult and like have a false memory that something happened to them when they were like six years old. And that's really not a situation you're going to be able to go back and really find any evidence um, of that happening or not happening. Um, so I think when it comes to like false memory, OCD and sleep, um, I think a lot of it comes down to finding ways to work on that rumination piece, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so finding ways to um, either have like, you know, I think sometimes we'll have like some kind of motto or statement, like the talking back to OCD type thing, right? So even as simple as like, okay, I recognize that this is an OCD thought. Um, I may not ever have full understanding of whether this did or didn't happen. And I'm going to work on being accepting of that. Um, so sometimes just like try to some statement, some way to really kind of essentially neutralize that ongoing rumination and kind of spiraling, right? So again, maybe we go back to that like guided meditation, guided sleeping where someone is talking you through like a meditation because then it it's for some people, maybe they can still have other thoughts while they're listening to something else. Uh, but for a lot of people, really only able to focus on one thing. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think, you know, making sure you're working if with a therapist or a psychologist or provider, if you can, um, to really be able to address that through like either, you know, ERP, CBT, ACT, ICBT, whatever um, kind of is the best treatment treatment approach for that person. Yeah. And as you're saying that, I know one thing that commonly comes up is this feeling of that somehow that feels negligent or it feels like somehow like, oh, but how, what do you mean? How can I just sit here and not try to address this. This just seems like such a big, big thing. How can you ask me to, right, have that talk, talking back to say, well, I may not have any answer to that. Um, what would you say for that? Yeah. I mean, I that's very tricky. You know, I think depending on the treatment approach you take, right, because there are kind of a couple really good and, and seemingly effective ones out there right now. Um, you know, depending on the treatment approach you take, like learning to accept either uncertainty is part of it. So kind of, you know, tolerating um, some of that difficulty. And if you're kind of taking an ERP approach or lens, um, which for some people that's helpful and some people really respond to that and, that, and that's great. Um, and with that, if that's kind of the approach someone's taking, then I, you know, it should be a gradual approach. Right. So maybe you're not sitting with that feeling for something that's like a really, you know, distressing false memory thought. Right. Maybe you've started with one that's a little, you know, less anxiety producing. Um, If you're taking some other approaches, um, then like ICBT, then you're working through kind of that obsessional story and finding out how, you know, OCD came up with its logic and trying to like identify those differences. Um, And then coming up with like, you know, the alternative story and going through some of those weird self um, kind of pieces. Um, So it really depends on the approach that you're taking, Um, whether you're like sitting with that uncertainty or trying to like kind of in the ICBT sense, like unmask 
OCD. I love it. Leonardo, I want to thank you so much for your time. I think this is such a valuable conversation we just had. So if people would like to find you, how can they find you? Sure. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. So finding me there. Um, you can also find me, um, childmind.org um, is my website or the company that I work for website. And then um, Child Mind Institute has Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and I'm all over those doing like um, videos and interviews. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Christina. <laughs>